Hello everyone. My best friend's mom just turned 83 on Halloween. I'm making her a pair of socks and I wanted it to have a thick cuff that wouldn't roll down. I reinforced the heel a little bit uh, with being a diabetic, feet swell, so I wanted it to be able to stretch a lot here. Let's get going. The yarn I used is Serenity Sock by Premier Yarns, and the colorway is Surf. This is a wool, bamboo, and nylon uh, blend. Something else I'm using, this is optional. Uh, this is called Reinforcing Thread. If you notice, it's got like a little bit of a stretch to it. It's got a little bit of elastic in there. I believe the ones I got actually has a little bit of wool in them as well. Uh, this is, like I said, optional. Typically, when this is used, it is, like I said, it's reinforcing thread. People will use it on the toes and the heels. Think of the socks in the store with the different color toes and heels. That's typically what that is. They reinforce the heel, well, reinforce the toe and the heel because those are just areas that wear the fastest. Now, I was able to, I, I don't even know if the company's still in business anymore, so I am sorry, but I was able to get like a hundred different collars of this. Uh, actually, I think it was like 90. Anyway, I got a whole bunch and they're on spools like this. Typically, you don't see it in spools this big. That's another reason why people typically just do the toe and the heel because you don't have enough to run through the entire sock. I figure if I'm putting all this time and energy into these socks, everybody wears socks differently. Uh, you'll wear different spots a little differently. So I run this through the entire sock. So when you see me working and you see a little extra thread with it, that's what this is. I run it together. I treat it as one strand. The only place I don't use this is on the initial cast on. The sock is made toe up. I like to do toe up socks. Uh, the Kitchener cast on, I know it can be intimidating, but I just, I really like how it looks and I do it so that it's on the bottom of the sock. That way, if there is a little bit of difference in your tension, which doesn't matter, but if there is and you don't want it to be noticeable at all, you put it on the bottom of the sock, no one's going to see it. This sock has two different Kitcheners. Kitchener cast on and a Kitchener bind off. So a lot of learn with this, a lot of things to learn with this pattern. We can go ahead and talk about the loom for a minute. This is the 60 peg 1 4th gauge sock loom from Cindy Wood Looms. This is the new one. You can get it custom. You just tell them what pegs you want marked and they'll, you know, double check and confirm with you to make sure that's exactly what you want. And uh, this is what I did. I, this loom is already set up for socks that I make for Jeremy. Now for Susie, I'm going to make the toe a little, a little more sharp. So I'm going to do my decrease and increase for the toe for eight stitches instead of seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that one right there and that one right there. That's just so I don't forget, I will be decreasing up to that far. To cast on, take your working yarn. We wanna cast on this side. Down through the inside of the loom, wrap it a couple times around your anchor peg. You will be starting by wrapping around the back and, you'll be starting by wrapping around the front of peg 60, then around the back and then the front of peg one. You basically just did a figure eight. From here, you just weave back and forth. Here 
over this side you have one peg left around the back and over the front now you go ahead and lock this stitch in take your working yarn over the front of peg 30 pull that bottom loop over the top and that is locked in now if you are using reinforcing thread this is a good point to go ahead and add that which all I'm doing is taking the end of it I got a little knot there let me break that off okay taking the end of it my yarn here's peg 30 I am wrapping it like this around peg 30 I'll twist it just a little bit and then I will be holding see I twist a little bit and I'll be holding all of those together and then we will either you can use there are three versions of the knit stitch if you hold the yarn over the top take that bottom stitch over oops I want both of the strands okay if you hold this yarn straight across and you take that bottom stitch over the top that is called the flat stitch it is a form of knit stitch it's just you you're going to have the tightest tension and the smallest knit stitches with your flat stitch because you really don't have a lot of tension now if you do use the flat stitch I suggest see how I'm holding it here I'm not holding it tight I'll hold it kind of loose in my hand and then knit over this first round is a, a bit awkward but I have a you know a little bit of slack on it another form of knit stitch is called the U stitch you wrap the yarn around the peg around the front kind of in a U shape and you take that bottom stitch over the top the only difference is you're just using a little bit more yarn so your tension's going to be a little less and you will uh, it, it's a slightly larger stitch than your flat stitch but it looks exactly the same now the true knit stitch I'll show you that one and you'll see why I typically stick with the uh, flat or the U stitch now you know when you purl you take if you don't know how to purl you take the loom tool down through the top of the stitch and you pull the string up and put that new loop on the peg the true purl the true knit stitch sorry is the opposite so you take all right all right there we go up through the bottom of the stitch and you're going to pull the working yarn down you've created a new stitch pop that off put that on I'll do a couple of these to show you it is more time consuming but it is it's going to be the largest out of the three forms and it will have the most stretch but in all honesty I it's not a huge huge difference I would use the U stitch just because of tension and things like that but there's your flat stitch your U stitch and your true knit stitch now I'm going back to my U stitch all right so peg 60 is right here this is my cast on strand I'm going to wrap the yarn around the front and around the back and put it going in the opposite direction and hold the working yarn over top you know just do whatever knit stitch you're doing lock that in now there are two stitches on this that is your first little decrease so right here that's your Kitchener cast on you can see where I've got actually it's the round above that is my Kitchener once it's done this was what I just showed you that first pass I did it extra loose because I 
didn't want it to be too tight. So you can see a little bit of difference in the stitches. But, so let me sit this up here so you can see it better. What we are doing is you decrease one, decrease one, decrease one. And what we're doing is working up to here. And that will give us that point. If you like your toes of your socks more pointy, you do your decrease in farther. If you like it a little more blunt, you do it out a bit more. Let's work back to the other side. Work back to peg 31. Peg 30. Yeah. Wrap around the front. Back in that opposite direction. First thing I do is lock that in. So there's two stitches here. You work back to peg 59, do the same. So 59, 31, 58, 32. You just keep going back and forth until you have two stitches on this one and you're at this peg right here. It doesn't look like much yet, but you just did this much work. Look at that. That whole little triangle right in this. You're going to see that this is super loose on this side. I push those stitches down. Uh, if they do pop off, which happens sometimes, you can put it back on there. Just try to make sure it doesn't get twisted because that can give you some frustrations later when you tighten this up. You ready for the, the increase? All right, so I'm on this peg. Here's my last decrease around the front, back the other way. All right, so go ahead and you work to your first decreased peg that you come to, not like peg 60, the first one you come to, knitting backwards. This is the first one with two stitches, one and two. You're going to knit over both of those stitches. And in doing that, I want to show you something that is very helpful for me with these looms. Look at these pegs. See that? They are flexible. And that's amazing for me. I tend to knit tight. So when I'm like, you'll notice it when we get to the cables at the top even more, but it's so nice. These are my favorite sock looms. Okay, so we knitted over that one. Now we are going to go back to that other side. We'll knit over this one, which like I said, I knit tight. I can already tell that stitch is tight on there, but watch what this peg does. I'm pushing it, see? I was holding it against my hand. I was able to push it over and I did not break any of these. That's all you do for your increase. And then what you'll be doing is the back part of this toe. This made it smaller and then you'll be working and it'll be getting bigger. Go back and forth until you have peg 31 and peg 60 to do still. Stop at that point, don't work those two pegs. It's still looking pretty crazy. You got all these loose strands over here. You can start to see the toe forming. So what you have done is your decrease, then your increase. At this point, we start working in the round. This first round right here, 
really the first two are going to be the most difficult just because there is zero tension. That's how doing this row right here is that row because you can see where some were uh, more loose than others. And the reason I left, we still have two stitches there and two stitches there, is so you don't end up with points here. You can see that's a little, that's a nicer curve to it. Work one round back to peg one. You have everything locked in, which I mean, you can pull on those to kind of even that out some. But you can see some of this is tight, some of it's a little more loose. It's gonna be on the bottom of the sock. Don't worry about it. I wanna show you one more thing before I have you just have at it and work the body of the sock. All you're doing is working in the round, but these are the first socks I've ever made for Susie. So I'm going to show you something I do when it's a sock. This is something I've recently started to do when I am making socks for people for the first time. This helps me be able to keep measurements and know exactly uh, any adjustments I need to make because for Susie's socks, the only thing I know is that her shoes are the same size as her daughter's, but there can still be differences. So if anything, I made these to where they may be a little big. Uh, I figure that's better than being too small. But what I got here, if I could find it, which what I did was I marked that round. These are a pair of socks I made for another friend and he hasn't got these yet, which is good because I can give you a good example of this. I put a string here and this is round 70. This is round 75. I wasn't sure if I needed 70 or 75. I'm finding 70 to 75 rounds on the 60 peg 1 fourth gauge loom is a really good size for a man's sock most of the time. So this is round 70, this is round 75. This is the middle part of the heel because you want this to line up with the back of the heel. And that's the top and that's where I went to the ribbing. That way, if I need to make the ribbing up a little higher, I can do that. If the heel's too big, I can see where I need to adjust all of it. And the string just pulls out. Show you how I'm doing this. I'm using, this is just a cotton yarn. Cotton seems to work good. Uh, make sure I have my yarn. Where am I at? Oh, I've got one more peg to work here. There we go, which it's not a big deal if you don't have it exact. I got my yarn. I'm a tapestry needle. I'm using cotton yarn. Uh, you want to use a contrasting collar. I would have used black, but I don't have any black cotton yarn, so I'm just using white. And what you're going to do is you're going to run the string through every peg. If you're worried about this being pulled out while you're getting that first one on there, just do that. Where am I here? Okay, I did that one. At this point, you can undo that cast on strand if you want. Now, I don't want to be picking these up as I'm working, so I'm actually going to take and just pop that string behind. Oops, I popped a stitch off, but it's marked. So I was able to put it right back on there. Nice. Okay. Like I said, these ones are much looser. As you can see, I'm actually have my, I have my finger on the back of the stitch here and I'm pulling the white over the peg so that it's behind. That way, when you're working, you're not gonna accidentally pick up these white 
stitches that will be removed later. I'm going to show you on this side a little easier because the other side you got your tension uh, very loose on that side right now. So show you what it looks like do this side. When you're working the stitches you won't be grabbing those white ones. And I'll take these strings just kind of throw them on the inside of the loom in there and get that one in there got it all tangled up here there we go throw that on the inside I'll go ahead and tie them a bit so those strings aren't uh, causing much trouble for me nothing pretty but it's in there at this point work in the round for, for this sock, I am doing 75 rounds for the body. Let me flip this inside out. I've taken a lot of the stitch markers off as I've done this, but I want my I want my socks to match. I want my socks to match exactly. And sometimes it's so easy to miss your count. So, so easy. So I will take and mark every 10 rounds. Sometimes I will mark every five. It just depends on what I'm doing. But every 10 rounds seems to be a good amount for me. And if you're unsure of how to count your rows, you're going to look at these bars back here. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You know, it just keeps going down. Now, when you're counting these, remember this is a stitch too. So that would be one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And when I get to round ten, I take a stitch marker. Let me grab one here. I will put it right on the stitch out here and then work or you can put them on the inside it really it's whatever works for you whatever helps you keep track of your rounds because if you work all the way up here and then go to the count it is very difficult it does help all right so I've got this round going I've already got my string there, so that really marks it, so I know what round one is. But just in case, I will go ahead and throw a stitch marker right here. Why not? And if you're working with a stitch marker, I'll show you how to knit past it. These little white strands, you can tighten them up. Now the stitch marker, you're going to flip right over there and just put it in the back. And then keep going. Whatever size you need for your sock, this one is 75 rounds. And I'm making it for a foot. I'm making it the same as I would make for Susie's daughter. So her foot's about 10 and a half inches long. And that happens to be about the same measurements of my other half. So right now what I'm doing is I'm like, okay, Jeremy, try this sock on. How does it fit? Because it, it can be a little tricky when you're making a sock for somebody who you've never made socks before, for before. And that's why, you know, I can easily tell if I put the toe on and... I don't like the way it fits. Okay, I know I need to add another decrease or it's too too pointy, another, you know, less. The heel, the body, I know this is five rows right here between the 70 and 75, so that gives me a good measurement of how many rows I need to remove if the sock is too large. 
and this is mainly because I do some flat stitches, purl stitches, not purl stitches, flat stitches, you, you know, some knit stitches above the heel before I start a texture. Uh, it just makes it a little more comfortable. I typically do anywhere from 5 to 15 rounds. This sock, I did 5. But work the sock up to the size you need. And then I'll show you how to get going on the heel. In the video description below is more information exactly on gauging and things like that. I haven't really went over that in this video. It can get kind of uh, in-depth. But this is kind of, a lot of this yarn is very similar. This should be a size 1 super fine. Yeah, it's a size 1 super fine yarn. Uh, this is some Patton's Croy size one super fine yarn. I notice both the Croy and the Premier Serenity do seem to work up about the same with the same gauging for measuring. As soon as your sock is long enough to where you can close this where both sides meet like that, then you know you have worked enough to be able to tighten this cast on edge up. So we'll go ahead and do that before we do the heel. Now you want to find the side that your cast on string is on. It's this side. So we're going to be starting on this side. Let me zoom this in. So this is the side we're going to start on and we are tightening up each string all the way across. And start here and I'm going to move back to the farthest one I can find which looks like this one. I'm going to pull it a little bit because if it's not it'll pull the one by it. All right, So then I'll get the next and pull it. See I keep my hand I don't need to hold all of it. Underneath, like this, that helps me hold the strings, sorry, hold the yarn in place while I work. I've got that one tightened, and then I'm going to go to the next one. Do watch because if you are working with a wool blend, wool wants to felt to itself. So you want to do this kind of slow in case you end up with any little, it'll be like little balls of fiber stuck to the yarn and sometimes it will cause uh, multiple strands to stick together. We're all the way to the end, so you can pull that last strand. So I got hung up a little bit. All right, there it is. So you want to cut the string long enough to be able to pull it on the inside and weave it in. One thing I do with this strand, it's not as much as it would be if you use the larger loom. That would produce more. Uh, but this yarn is kind of, I mean, waste yarn, I guess. But I don't want to waste it. So I wrap it up into a ball. And then when you do your second sock, add it to this ball and then label the yarn and the pair of socks you made with it. And then if you ever need to repair a hole in the sock, you will still have some of the yarn that goes with it. I started doing this a while back and I'm very happy that I did. That way, patches will be the same color. I just do a woven patch. I don't really tend to do the ones that are like super intricate and look just like it. You can. I typically don't. That takes a lot more time. 
Okay. Heel time, everybody. Heel time. Let's look at this toe again. The row you just tightened up is this top row right there above that. If you want, see how there's a few stitches right here that are a little looser? You can go through like this and slowly tighten them up, but you're going to have to go all the way across to get that excess string over here to pull it. So me, I don't do that. See, it's not a big difference. And when the socks washed and everything sort of relaxes, this is on the bottom of the foot anyway. Heel. Heel, everybody. We did the toe going this way. The heel, we're going to be going this way. You'll notice some patterns have you do the heel and the toe on the same side. That's less pegs to mark, yada, yada. I like to have my cast on edge on the bottom of the foot so that's really the only reason I do that so if that's not an issue you just want to do them on the same side have at it you're good okay our working yarn is here you want to work all the way over to that peg Heel time, let's do this. Before I really start, I just want to place a stitch marker so I know this right here on the loom, that's round 75, even though I do have it marked with the white string, I'm still marking it that way. Heel is done this side of the loom. The toe was done this side. A lot of times you'll notice patterns have the heel and toe done on the same side. You can do that and that's perfectly fine. The only reason I switch it is so that my cast on edge that gets tightened up is on the bottom of the sock. 100% optional. We're going to go ahead and work over to this peg. I went ahead and added one of the placeholder strands at the very back point of the heel. It'll be right here. That way when it's on the foot, I can make sure the heel is resting in the correct spot. From here, you go ahead and do your increase back and forth until you get to one on each side. It'll be this one and this one. I'm gonna go ahead Grab a couple stitch markers here. I'm going to mark this peg and this peg. It's your first decrease on each side. You will be picking these stitches up. Uh, it's an optional step, but if you want to reinforce your heel a little bit, I hope I can get both those stitches on a stitch marker. There we go. If you want to reinforce the heel a little bit, uh, you want to have these stitches marked, held out. It makes it a little easier to do. So go ahead, work back and forth increasing until you have this peg and this peg left. They'll be your stitch markers and do one round. Here are our stitch markers, and we can see they have two stitches on each of them. You're going to want a crochet hook. Uh, these little ones like this, I really like. They're small enough to fit in. I got this little tin that I have some extra stitch markers and things like that. Uh, these ones are nice. You can find them most craft stores. They sell them individual by themselves. This is what I like to use. Any crochet hook will work. You want a, well, you want a smaller top to be able to get the stitches good. Susie is a diabetic, so I don't want to tighten this entire heel area because that's going to reduce the amount of stretch she has or if your feet are swelling or anything like that. Instead, but I still want to cover up the area where you get trouble and you have your heel holes. 
I just picked up, see, these are the bars we're picking up. I just picked up the last five. And what I mean by that, let me zoom this in. Okay, so we're looking for those same bars that we see here. Of course, they're not going to be quite as easy to see because they're still stretched on the loom. But if we stretch this, you can see them right here. So I'm going to start up here at the top. The two stitches I'm counting as one. So we got one, two, three, four, and five. Get my hook, count that again, make sure I got it right. So one, two, three, four, five. Pick that fifth one and the fourth one up. Zoom this out a little bit. All right, you're gonna pick up number four and five, pull four through stitch five, pick up stitch three, pull it through, pick up stitch two. Oh, I wanna try to get both those strands. If you miss one, that's okay. And I dropped it, let me do that stitch again. See, I twist this to make it easier to pull it through. not paying attention enough guys there we go okay so now we have these stitches on here take that off you're going to pull both of those through and then you put them back on the peg they were originally on sometimes they are twisted I gotta get an angle core I can see what I'm doing here all right, again, this is where flexi pegs come in handy. Let me do this other sh other side. So here we are. We got one, two, three, four, and five. So pick up four and five, four through five. Uh, three through four, two through three, put one on there, take your stitch marker off, one through two, and then one back on the loom. See, that went a lot smoother. I'm going to add another uh, placeholder strand. That way I will have accurate measurements of the entire heel size. Work five rounds of just your knit stitch. So right now you are right here. You're gonna do five rounds here. That just gives a little bit of clearance above the top of the heel where your ankle is. I typically do five to 15 rounds. I'll show you what this looks like on the outside. It's just your knit stitch, whichever one you're using. So here's where I reinforced that. And here's the five rounds. Of course, at the end of the five rounds, I'm going to put another placeholder strand. So if I wanna adjust the size of this area, I'll have a good uh, reference to how I need to adjust it adjust it. I haven't like pulled and stretched on the sock since I've started this area. I know you get excited and it starts forming and you just want to see oh how big is it going to be because it looks so misshapen up here. This right here is not an accurate reference of how uh, of the space for five rounds. It's going to stretch and look bigger. That's one thing to always think about when you're making socks, or well, really anything, because it's all stretched out. It's gonna look bigger up here. That does make your swatches and gauging somewhat important. I've made multiple pairs of socks from this yarn. So I already know how it works up, how it stretches, how it wears. I know how I knit, so I know my gauging and everything. I 
got this on an amazing deal and I don't remember if I got like 15 or 20 rolls of it. It was a lot. They actually had it at a Dollar Tree back when Dollar Tree was actually $1 items. And so I got as many as I could at that time. Which if you go out and buy sock yarn, you're going to see why. And the, and the yarn, it's nice. It's a bamboo wool uh, nylon blend. So it's a really nice yarn. Alright, I'm going to go ahead and put this little strand here in. I'm going to take my hand down through the inside of the sock. I just want to put it through a stitch that's just really close. Oh, let me get my camera. Yeah, it doesn't... It's just something close. Get this on the inside and then I'll weave it in later. But you won't even see where that's at. It's time for the cuff. All right. So let's talk about this for a minute. You're going to need your knit stitch and your purl stitch, you know, whichever knit stitch you prefer. You'll want some little stitch markers. For this, I use, I don't use the dangly ones, but you'll need some stitch markers. You'll need them for how many cables there are. So there's one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. So you'll need five stitch markers here, which we'll get to that in a few minutes. Just make sure you have those. It makes it much easier. But what we're doing is we are right here with our sock. You're going to do five rounds of a two by four rib stitch. And what that means is you will purl two stitches, knit four, purl two, knit four. You're going to do that across. for 10 rounds. To do the purl stitch, I mentioned before about the purl stitch. It is the exact opposite of the true knit stitch. So you'll take your loom tool, put it down through the top of the stitch on the loom working yarn underneath that stitch and pull it up through. You created the loop which makes the new stitch. Pop the old one off, put the new one on. Let's do that again. Loom tool down through the top of the stitch on the loom with your working yarn below the stitch. You're going to pull the yarn up through the original stitch creating your new one. Pop it off and tighten it up. And then you will knit four, two, three, four. Helps if this is up a little higher. All right, I'll show how to purl again. Down through the top. Oops. There are two different types of cables, the left cross and the right cross. This is the left cross. The higher end is going towards the left. And then I did one round on the inside of the loom of right cross uh, to show you the difference, which the top of it is going towards the right. They twist in opposite directions. I did this one, the left cross, so the second sock I'm doing right cross, just to switch it up a bit. You can use either one, you can use both. If you rotate them back and forth, it ends up, you know, kind of like a, a piece of candy, is what it reminds me of, where the ends are twisted. I'm going to show you how to do the left cross cable first, but I'm actually going to be doing the right cross for this sock. The cable's done over four pegs. You'll be taking the stitches off peg three and four and putting them on peg one and two. To do that, you've got to remove the stitches from peg one and two first. 
So I'm going to get the stitch from peg two, put it on the stitch marker, and then get the stitch from peg one. See that second one's already on there, so you don't want to pull it out too far. There's not enough give to just take these stitches off and move them over. What I need to do is you work those stitches one at a time, then move them. Working yarn behind the two empty pegs and over top peg three, knit over. Then you're moving the stitch from peg three to peg one. I tighten it up pretty good. Then yarn behind peg two and three over peg four, knit over. Take the stitch from peg four, place it on peg two, tighten that up, working yarn between peg one and two, coming out towards you. Now we take the first stitch, zoom this in a little bit. Take this first stitch off. See, it's pretty tight, but that's a benefit of this loom. You're going to place it on peg three. Oops. There. Go ahead and work that peg. Knit over. There you go. That created a lot more tension where this one's easier to pull. Take that off and put it on peg four. Then you work peg four. And go back into your normal pattern. And then you will knit these four, purl these two, do a cable on these four the same way. Take the stitches from peg three and four, work them, and put them on peg one and two, and then put stitches, original stitches from one and two on three and four. Purl, knit, purl, cable set. So there will be five cable sets. right cross cable you take the stitch from peg three and four place it on your stitch marker i already did that around the whole loom i find that helps it just go smoother you don't have to stop and count take some thought out of it if you will <laughs> uh, it helps me keep things the way they need to be you're doing the same thing you, as the left cross. You will be knitting the stitches that are still here and moving them to the empty pegs. But it's the right cross, so you will be move, moving the stitches on peg one and two to the right to peg three and four. You go ahead and work peg one and move it over and tighten that stitch. No, that's not right. Instead of working one peg at a time, you actually work both of them. So knit peg one, knit peg two. And then take peg two, put on peg four, peg one, put on peg two, and tighten that up. Place that first stitch over on peg one and take that second one and put it on peg two. If you do the true knit stitch, there will be more stretch to these so it won't be so tight on the pegs. Take your working yarn, it's actually coming from peg three but it's a little stretched under there. I don't know if I can show you where you can see it. Working yarn behind 
pay three and four, purl stitch five. You're going to notice this first purl is going to be tighter than the second one. And then knit four. Purl two. Knit two. I come to empty pegs. So I'll loosen that up a little bit. Loosen my tension. Peg two to four. Peg one to three. Stitch one to peg one. Stitch two to peg two. This is the first cable round, but this is actually round 15 of the cuff. Every 10 rounds, you will be doing a cable row and the rest will be the two by four ribbing, the purl two, knit four ribbing. So uh, round 16 through 24, you do the ribbing stitch. And in round 25, you do a cable round. I did one, one, two, three, four, five cable rounds. So here's the one we're working on now. Two, three, four, and five. Well, actually, it's... That's the one we're doing now. And where the stitches are much tighter... See, there isn't as much of a gap. If you look, see how this comes up a bit? There's a little more give the way that one's done, or the way I do that one, than the way I do this one. If I am doing a one by one, uh, a two stitch cable, sorry, we're doing a four stitch cable. If I'm doing a two stitch cable, I will always just take them off, twist them, and then go. You will be doing six, no, sorry, you will be doing five cable sets. So we got one, two, three, four, five. Right now, you are right here. This is round 15. You have your five and then your 10. So this is round 15. You're going to work nine rounds of the two by four ribbing where you purl two, knit four, purl two, knit four, purl two, knit four. Round 25 will be a cable row. Round 35, 45, and 55 will also be cable rounds. Everything else will just be the ribbing. After uh, that fifth set that, that puts you at round uh, 56, I believe, it's time to do the cuff. Take your working yarn and wrap it around the loom three times and then cut. This is the yarn you're going to use to bind off with. We're doing a doubled cuff here. And we're using a Kitchener bind off. So it duplicates the stitches that are there and it has uh, the same like stretch to it. Here it is on the inside. It has a very nice stretch to it. If you don't want to do the Kitchener bind off, you can use the super stretchy bind off. I'll have a link to that in the video description below. The Kitchener is the nicest. Uh, the super stretchy will work as well because it's on the inside of the sock. 
We need to take the stitches from row five of our cuff and put them back on the loom. Row five stands out because that is the last row of your knit stitches before you start going into the ribbing. So, and here are the purl stitches. So you will see these loops. I also have row five marked with the placeholder strand, but these are the stitches. And you'll be taking these and putting them back on the loom and then doing the bind off. I find it easier if I mark them. So I only marked the stitches at the end of the ribbing simply because I don't have enough stitch markers to mark every single stitch. And also it's just, it's four stitches in between. So it's, uh, you're not going to get off too far. It's going to be okay. I want to start here. Follow the ribbing behind it till I get to the end of the sock. Which I already knew which one it would be and I marked it red. Pull that down. That one goes there. You can go around and just put the stitch markers to fill in. Now you will be pulling pull the stitches in between up and they're going to be this bar right here. One, two, three, four. Working yarn is coming from between peg 60 and peg 1. We are working peg 1. Each peg has two stitches on them. The top is stitch 1, the bottom is stitch 2. Peg 1, peg 2, peg 3, peg 4, stitch 1, stitch 2. We are going to knit the bottom stitch, stitch 2, on peg one. So pull the yarn down through the top of the bottom stitch. Knit the top stitch, stitch one of peg one. Pull the working yarn down through the top A piece of fuzz stuck in it. Second peg, purl the top stitch, stitch one. So working yarn up through the bottom of the stitch. Purl stitch two of peg one. Stitch one, stitch two, stitch two. If it's hard for you to see it, you can separate it out here. 
the color of the yarn is blending in with the pegs where I'm at. Peg one is complete. Peg two is now your new peg one. And peg three would be the new peg two. So step one, knit stitch two, peg one. That's yarn down through the top of the stitch. Knit, stitch one, peg one. Yarn down through the top. Purl, Stitch one, peg two, Let's yarn up through the bottom. You're going to go back one and purl stitch two of peg one. That peg is done, so peg three is now peg one. Knit stitch two of peg one. Knit stitch one of peg one. Purl stitch one of peg two. Purl stitch two of peg one. Peg three is done. You can take it off the loom. Good, and weave in your end. What I do is run it up through the middle of the cuff. If you used the placeholder yarn, you can go ahead If you have the safety yarn in, when you go to remove it, it should just come out pretty easy. I got a little piece here. The knot stuck on the inside. But it should just pull straight out. I need to keep the rest of these in there for now. I'm not done getting my measurements. But that's how you take those strands out. You just pull the string and it takes it completely out. Here they are. I really like this yarn. Pretty happy with how the cables turned out. I hope you guys enjoyed this pattern. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section below. Thank you for watching and I hope you have a wonderful day.